All right, the name of the game today is Kicking Off Project 3. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna give a brief lecture and then we'll talk more about the specifics of Project 3. Again, understanding that everybody's super busy now and it's again, it's the second part of November. Um, everybody's trying to get as much done as they can before Thanksgiving. And then of course, you're just gonna be that much busier and tired um, after Thanksgiving. And uh, so anyway, the, the name of the game for project three is come to class during the scheduled required meeting times. You know, get your project done during class with me. Um, otherwise you fall behind and well, I'm not gonna be so sympathetic because I'm busy too. <laughs> Surprise. Anyway, so just come to class and I'll keep you um, along on, on uh, 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 how do you say, um, I'll keep you, keep you on track. Um, can you guys see Canvas up here? Yeah, okay. All right, so you can see um, in module three has been um, published and actually has some content to it now. Um, so the first page here is the, the sort of introductory brief. Um, and then I'll, I'll just post the week-to-week the -week stuff, um, you know, like what we did or what we're going to do, um, followed by the course recording um, afterwards, okay? So we'll talk more about the project in just a bit. But we're gonna, talk a little sort of higher level here about um, um, some a number of topics that come up when you're talking about advanced digital media, which is, you know, of course, what this course is about. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to, um, we're going to use a new plugin called Rabbit. <laughs> Annoyingly, it's like another creature name. Um, so you're going to have another critter to your laptop. This one's Rabbit. Um, but essentially, uh, Rabbit uses um, or, or extends your, your uh, design space um, in a number of different ways, dealing with um, some very common generative systems. Um, one type of system is called a Lindemeyer system, or L system for short. Um, the other one is called a cellular automata. Okay. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. And we'll talk more about, um, you know, your one assignment between classes between now and Wednesday is just to download and install Rabbit. Um, you have to log in, which means you have to create a little account. It's not, it doesn't cost any money. Um, you'll actually get uh, both the login and for, or sorry, the, the install files, but you also get some documentation on how to use the plugin, uh, which is okay, whatever. But um, we'll, we'll go over that stuff um, and I'll give you a file to use um, on Wednesday. Um, but, but more importantly, you also get the instructions for how to install. So follow those instructions to a T. Yeah. Um, and that way everybody hopefully installs this between now and Wednesday without a, without flaws. That's the hope anyway. That's the real trick, um, isn't it? So um, just make sure my chat box is up. Okay, great. All right, so. Really quickly, um, project three is meant to be more of a fun project where you, you're not gonna have to like sort of, uh, um, uh, where you're not gonna have to uh, worry too much about doing all the heavy lifting, um, but you will sort of be exposed to this idea of how to leverage computation going forward, right? Um, already I've seen um, these sort of generative design systems um, even coming out of Autodesk, which is like the, you know, the massive inertia, inertia um, laden, um, uh, you know, Revit, you know, they sort of have these tools where you can begin to use um, a generative solver or sorry, an evolutionary solver in order to try to um, generate a number of solutions that are most fit based off of some sort of criteria um, when the, the solution isn't necessarily um, so easy to figure out um, on your own. And so, you know, this idea of being able to leverage computational systems to actually generate things for you based off of your recipes, in which case you might not actually know what's gonna come out of the system. Um, but if you can begin to look at the results and then begin to design the system um, with the uh, uh, parameters in mind, then you start to get all kinds of interesting um, non-determinate results that actually meet the criteria that you're looking for, okay? And so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the computer as a sort of um, designer. Right. In other words, you're creating the, the sort of algorithm to sort of ger generate a bunch of stuff, but the, really the, the algorithm is going to spit out stuff that you maybe not even could have dreamed about. Right. And so it's up to your imagination to sort of, you know, 
um, wind up the clock, sort of set the initial um, seeds or information to work off of, and then let the computer do the rest. Okay. All right, and so I'm going to start with an example from 1986. A computer scientist named Craig Reynolds created a simulation for how birds flock together. He called it BOIDS, B-O-I-D-S. I can't remember exactly what BOIDS stands for, so I'll just refer to Wikipedia here. Birdoid object. Um, it seems to me like BOIDS was actually, they came up with an interesting acronym with BOIDS. But um, this idea that, um, let me just pull up an example here. I don't know if you guys can see it. But these phenomena where birds actually flock together, right? And bear in mind that, you know, none of these birds as independent agents have this sort of larger picture of the flock in mind. Um, but it's all of these sort of very local um, uh, relationships and reactions between each bird. Um, that begins to create a sort of emergent, larger phenomenon, right? Um, these sort of uh, patterns in the sky. Sorry, I'm going to turn the, I think the sound is just in my, my. Um, do you guys hear the noise? No, okay, so you don't hear the, sorry, I'm going to turn it down then. It's really, really quite loud in my earphones. Sorry, I'm starting to get talk louder and talk louder, okay? But what's interesting is this sort of natural phenomenon, this sort of bottom-up emergent phenomenon where you start to see a bunch of simple parts acting in very simple ways actually create a much more uh, complex sort of larger emergent system, okay? And so none of these birds are actually, you know, again, um, thinking of, a, of, of, you know, the higher level ideas here, um, but they're just responding to their neighbors, right? Don't get too close, don't get too far away, don't get too separated. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, based off of that, those sort of rules and that logic over time, right, you begin to get this sort of larger, it's kind of a quite beautiful phenomenon, right? And so not to belabor this too much, but if I go back to Boyd's, right, this idea of, of the rules, right? I don't know if you guys can see this and then just see if I can blow it up. Nope, I guess I can't. Let me just see if I can do this here. Oh, seriously? All right. Sorry, I'll try to be a little smarter. Right, the rules applied in, in Boyd's, right? You know, again, don't get too separated. How to maintain alignment based off of the average of the neighbors, right? And how not to get too close. Okay. And so figuring out how to actually, um, you know, encapsulate that algorithm computationally, right? Um, then you can begin to actually model these sorts of phenomena, the flocking in this case. Um, using this sort of Boyd simulation, these simple set of rules, right? Um, I'm just gonna briefly show you this, right? This is a, just a, a, a digital simulation of the same thing, right? Where you start to have a few stray birds introduced into the flock and then the flock responds and then, you know, you have several groups, right? And it's all just based on simple rules. Right? Now, the interesting thing is that again, while the rules are simple and Honestly, the agents here, these triangles or birds or whatever you want to call them, voids, um, are quite simple, right? The sort of larger effect is not trivial. It can't, you can't really figure it out in your head, right? It don't only happen over time with lots and lots and lots of simulations in order to sort of understand um, the sort of what, what emerges, what comes out, okay? And I think that's really interesting, this term called emergence. And we'll talk about that a little more, right? When I say complex systems, what I'm talking about are systems in which all the pieces have so many interdependencies and are so interconnected, right? Um, and so, you know, the idea of, of maybe separating the terms complex, right, from simple, and then complex from uh, complicated, right? Complicated means, um, you know, uh, maybe the opposite of complex. So complex means, uh, again, a complex system is one in which all the parts are uh, have so many interrelationships and so many um, interactions, right, that we couldn't possibly guess what the results would be once the system actually um, manipulates itself through time. Okay. 
All right, let's move on to a different system. Let's move on from Boyd's. L systems, which are short for Lindemeyer systems. Lindemeyer being um, the, the computer scientist that actually developed um, these sort of self-similar fractal-like systems. Yeah. Aristide Lindemeyer, he came up with these in 1968 when he published um, his results um, of these sort of rule-based rewriting systems. Okay. And the idea is that if you can sort of think about this just for a moment, let's uh, just zoom in here, right? For example, Lindemeyer created a system to try to um, simulate the growth of algae. And so what he did is he created a set of variables, constants, an axiom, and a, a set of rules, okay? So in other words, he created two variables, A and B, right? And then he created a set of rules where every step of the way, A turns into AB, and then afterwards, B turns into A. And so at generation zero, you start with A. At generation one, A turns to AB. Okay. Then B turns into A, right? And so you can see down here in this example, this branch, right? A turns into A and B. A turns into AB. Then A turns into AB. Then A turns, all the A's turn into AB. B's always turn into A's, and then the A's always turn into AB's. And so what you can begin to understand is that this is a system of growth. There are a number of steps or uh, what you might say um, uh, um, ticks, right? And each generation that's produced based on, at each tick, um, then it comes from the generation before based off of these rules. So A turns into A, B, and B turns into A at each generation or tick. Okay. And what's interesting about these systems is that they're actually quite nice to sort of generate plants and other sorts of um, natural geometries, right? Um, but what you can begin to understand is that once you start to take A and then convert it to AB and then turn AB into A, AB and A and B again, um, then what you end up with is a sort of fractal geometry where large components turn in are actually a, a set of smaller self-similar components when you start to zoom in. So you can see that this thing starts to actually branch and duplicate and grow. Um, but again, they're always um, sort of here's um, A, B, or sorry, here's A, and then here's A, and then here's A, and then here's A, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, what's fun is that you can actually find these sort of systems online that run um, in your browser, um, either through um, HTML5 or, or um, uh, sometimes JavaScript. So here's an example where you can change the rules, you can change some of the parameters, like the amount of angles, and then you have it redraw. You can also tell how many iterations you want, right? So for instance, I can start to render this one starting 20 increment of 50 degrees. If I change that to maybe 60 degrees, let's see what happens. It starts to actually become much tighter, right? As this thing starts to draw across, right? And it's all about a set of, a set of uh, um, lines, right? And each line or branch of a line is F or AA or A or F, right? And so this is a sort of nomenclature derived from these sort of set of rules where you're replacing an F with an AA and then every A becomes an F again, right? So this thing begins to grow and grow and grow and grow. And um, probably, I don't know, I got to be careful here, but probably in an exponential way, okay, in some cases, right? And so I could begin to change some of these parameters, Let's change that to 30. Now it's going to be much less tight. I don't know if I can even zoom out. It's not, it's not showing me I can. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, maybe I'll pick something closer to oh, 60 here. Yeah. And the same thing, here's another one. Um, again, I just found it on the web. Um, but here you can change the number of iterations, the angle for how to draw um, your line work, um, and then the set of rules, right? And so each one of these is generated off a set of rules. If I changed one of the angles, this is starts at 25 is the angle. If I set that to, let's say, 45 and draw it out, right, then suddenly the results change, right? Um, if I do 90, you know, again, I get much different results based off of the exact same rules, right? Okay, so a disproportionate um, change in one of these numbers can lead to a large 
um, qualitative change in the results, right? In, in the way that they look. The smaller the angle in this case, the sort of more compressed the system gets. Um, the larger, we go back to 90, right? And uh, uh, the, the wider the, the results get. Try like an 84, something like a non-round number. Pretty wild, huh? Okay, same thing here, all right? So F equals F plus F minus F minus F plus F, right? And so we begin to change these things. Let's try 120. Yeah, interesting. If you go 180, then you start getting results like zero. So anyway. But within this simple sort of framework, right? This sort of L systems or Linnemeyer systems, um, you can produce all kinds of results based off of simply changing the rules, okay? Based off of the actual algorithm that you plug in, you develop. All right, let's move on. Right, again, we just talked about two or three different types of generative systems, right? These sorts of uh, rules-based systems where you give it a set of ingredients, you tweak a few parameters, you sort of wind up the clock and then you let it go and it produces something, right? Um, here's another example. It's called Conway's Game of Life. I don't know. Those who are my age <laughs> might remember Windows 3.1 and, you know, before Windows 95. Um, they used to come with Minesweeper as a game, and it also came with Game of Life. And this was one of the things you could actually do, was turn cells on and off with your mouse, and then hit play and watch it sort of play out based off of these rules. Conway's Game of Life is probably the most commonly known um, cellular automata system, okay? Um, and so cellular automata um, refers to a graph-based system, a grid, where each cell is either live or dead. And then over time, um, over generations, cells die or, or give birth um, or come to life. Um, and so, over uh, a number of generations, right, the patterns, patterns begin to emerge um, that are sort of pixel-based, okay? And so you can begin to see over here with this animated, looks like just an animated Jeff, right? Um, this idea of these black pixels turning on and off based off of these preset rules, right? On and off meaning they die or they, they uh, spring to life, okay? Conway's Game of Life, it's a really simple set of rules, okay? So imagine a grid of square cells, right? Black cells are alive, white cells are dead, right? So populated or unpopulated. Every cell interacts with its eight adjacent neighbors, right? Um, and so any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies because of underpopulation. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. Any cell with more than three live neighbors dies because of overpopulation. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell, as if by reproduction. It's those four simple set of rules that can generate an enormous amount of complexity. You can see some of the sort of preset things that people have figured out, right? When you start to um, generate a set of patterns, the sort of initial live um, cell seeds, right? And then the system can achieve some sort of um, homeostasis, right? In other words, you just keep going indefinitely for an infinite number of time in a predictable way, right? It starts to, to achieve a, a homeostasis. Others, of course, aren't. I mean, this is, again, another uh, sort of example of stuff you can always find. Um, but I'm just going to highlight some more cells here and quickly play this out. Go ahead and do a couple of preset ones here. Right now, if I, again, if I think about this set of rules and I start to make things too dense, what happens? Right, all of the, the cells in the middle here, right, are gonna die because the rules are if you have three or more, if you have more than three adjacent cells that are living, it, the system's overpopulated, right? And so let's just see what happens, right? Again, sometimes these things die out really quickly. 
because there's not enough mass. Sometimes there's overpopulation, and so things actually get really busy, and then suddenly they, they blow out um, just as quickly. Let me just... What's interesting is that you're actually going to be playing with these cellular automata, but in a three-dimensional way. Okay. I'll go ahead and hit start. Actually, let's just hit the next button, right? Ah, we already have a change in the, um, in the, uh, um, the next, uh, uh, what do you call it, generation, right? And then next one, and the next one, next one, next one. I can go ahead and let this go. In fact, I can speed up the time a little bit, right? So these have achieved some sort of homeostasis, right? In other words, no new cells are gonna be reproduced and no cells are gonna die because they've found a, a sort of uh, um, uh, uh, balance, I guess, right? Between the quantity and the spacing. It's kind of like when you walk outside in the desert and you see the spacing between all the plants and the desert floor. These are always just gonna flick on and off, vertical, horizontal, right? And it looks like some of these things, eh, this might start to migrate down. And if it actually hits one of these, then I can actually throw it out of balance. Or it fizzles out completely. Right? Kind of an interesting thing. You can begin to see that there's all sorts of different configurations that lead to different results. Some people give them names, which is really weird. I mean, I guess if you don't have time on your, that much time on your hands. Stop this for a minute. Try to build up some density here. Yeah. All right. And again, the rules are down here, right? Not enough population or overpopulation, things die, right? If you have just the right amount of, um, or just the right circumstances, right? Suddenly you can begin to actually reproduce cells, populate, repopulate. Very simple set of rules can actually do quite some interesting things, right? When it comes to time and repetition. And so what we're talking about here is a number of generations in order to be able to actually produce something rather complex. I'm just gonna to try to move my chat box out of the way here, sorry. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention um, an architect that um, wrote about this stuff in the 80s 70s and 80s, actually, I believe. His name is John Fraser. He taught at the Architectural Association of London, probably one of the best architecture schools in the known universe. And uh, one of the things that he was doing back in the 80s, before um, personal computers were that big of a thing, um, was trying to understand how computation and design um, might work together. One of the things he actually looked at were cellular automata in order to begin to make these sort of generate um, these sorts of forms sort of think about how design might actually be generated um, by complex algorithms, complex system algorithms. What's interesting is that he looked back at certain, um, certain rules-based systems from before, like let's say the classical orders, and then began to let the computers actually generate new classical orders based off of the rules or, or tweaking the rules here and there. And what the results of his experimentation with his students became called evolutionary architecture. So he was really interested in this idea of um, winding the clock, generating a set of rules and then letting the generations pile up. And so you end up with something um, uh, uh, quite complex based off of, you know, but simply sim starting simple, but then over time building up something actually quite complex. Sorry, it's been a while since I've actually talked about real ideas. It's, it's like this staying at home thing is just like screwed up my head. I almost forgot, you know, I haven't, can't go to the library and get stuff, um, like to read and things anymore. So it's bizarre, but just thought I would point that out. His name is John Fraser. 
Um, in the book that he uh, put out, um, AA still uses uh, or still uh, gives, gives it out for free. Um, you can find it on issue for free. I think you can even download the PDF if you're so inclined. Of course, you don't have to do that. But if you're a geek like me, of course you would. All right. I'm going to leave this up because it'll be a reminder at the end. We'll talk more about Rabbit again. But at this point, I'm just going to transition and let's talk about the specifics of Project 3 and why I just talked about cellular automata. Okay. Let's go to the intro here. Okay. In fact, this image that I've been using as my background was actually generated from a cellular automata system, so a CA. I start with a couple of quotes. One is by Herbert Simon. Um, he was a systems analyst um, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, he worked at Carnegie Mellon and did a lot of research, um, paid research, um, with a lot of different organizations and companies. Um, one of his groundbreaking uh, ideas um, was this idea of how do we begin to describe complex systems, self-organizing systems, and emergent systems. I stole this quote from him and of course credit it to him, but um, that starts out by saying by a complex system, in other words, he's explaining um, in his paper that he wrote for the American Philosophical Society in 1962. He starts talking about complex systems and so first he tries to sort of give a, a nice, um, neat, um, quick and understandable explanation of what a complex system is. So he says, by a complex system I mean one made up of a large number of parts that interact in non-simple ways. Okay, again, so if you look at the ingredients, what we need are a lot of parts and a lot of um, generations and a lot of um, um, uh, sort of behaviors and responses to each other, right? In such systems, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Okay. In the most important pragmatic sense that if we look at the parts and we look at their properties and we look at how they interact, it's not a trivial matter to sort of understand what they actually make or that the sort of properties of the whole that they create. Okay, in other words, the parts and how they interact are so complex, there's so many of them, right, that we couldn't possibly understand what the results might be when we start, okay? And that's what a complex system is, right? One in which we have to let things play out and the results only emerge over time rather than something that's so simple um, because the interactions are, aren't, so, uh, aren't, so, or aren't so complex that we could actually figure it out on our own, right? So if you think about this for a moment, right? Cause and effect, right? So for instance, if we think about just one car hitting into a, let's say a pedestrian, we can understand what the results probably are. It's pretty, pretty grim, okay? But now if you zoom out and look at an entire city grid, and you start to look at each car, not, not individually, but you understand that the rules that they have, right? How they make right turns, how they have to stop at red lights, how they can move through green lights, right? Um, so, many, so many percentage are gonna turn on the left, turn left or turn right, and number, a certain percentage will continue going straight. The overall emergent effect is something that we couldn't necessarily understand, but we'd have to sort of play out, right? And so um, it's this idea of, um, uh, complex systems as a, a way to begin to understand um, the behavior of things that, um, or to study the behavior of things, right, that are really complex. So if we start thinking about um, nature, um, we start thinking about cities, right, we start to understand that these are actually an, a layered um, uh, construct of complex systems that interact with each other over time. And obviously, I mean, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's uh, too, too big of a stretch to say that nobody can actually tell the future, right? Okay, and so all of these interactions, again, it's, it's sort of, they act in non-simple ways, and it's not a trivial matter of sort of understanding what the results are gonna be in, in, um, ahead of time, okay? So, now, again, I just want to sort of, again, think about this now as it relates to architecture. Um, Cristiano Ciccato, is an old buddy of mine. He used to work at Frank Geary's uh, Geary Technologies company. Now he's uh, like 
I haven't seen him in a million years. Um, he's in Europe. He works for Zaha Hadid's office, still going. Um, and he basically heads the computational side of things there. Um, back in 2001, he wrote the following. When he was talking about um, sort of architects as tool makers, right? Not necessarily making the designs, but making the tools that could actually create the designs for us. Okay. So not just being software consumers, but actually software designers. He says a fundamental paradigm shift in which instead of creating a single solution, the designer can now create systems which can produce countless variant solutions from rules and mechanisms that respond to our any conditions or intentions that we want. Right? And when this happens, computers become interlocutors. They're not just our tools, they're not our slaves, they're actually our peers, our interlocutors. Designer and computer form a partnership of complements, each contributing specific abilities and knowledge to the overall task of architecture. All right. And so this isn't saying that computers will replace humans, right? But saying that computers and computation have a certain set of things that they're really good at, right? When it comes to memory, crunching large numbers really quickly, crunching through countless um, uh, generations of performing a set of rules-based system, uh, rules-based steps um, within milliseconds, right? Um, whereas humans are really good at sort of determining what the rules should be and if the results are actually productive or not, right? If they're fit to move on to the next generation. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to grow our own city blocks, grow our own buildings using cellular automata for project three. You will be giving a grasshopper file once you've downloaded and installed uh, Morpho code, Rabbit Morpho code. Um, on Wednesday, you'll give it a file. You'll play around with it. We'll, I'll show you how it works in class. And then you'll start to create your own, grow your own city blocks, right? You'll each be able to determine your own ingredients, your own sort of geometric building block. You'll then uh, create your own seed condition and then you'll watch it grow over time. And it quite literally will grow vertically. Titled Urban Cellular Aggregations, this project will explore and deploy generative systems, specifically, specifically cellular automata, in order to aggregate small units into a larger, more complex system that populates and form a larger urban fabric. The objectives of this project are to understand how generative systems can be leveraged in the design process to complete to, to create complex systems. Sorry, I'm trying to talk too fast. To generate massing design scenarios using a CA system. CA meaning cellular automata. To draw and generate format and then craft a set of projective drawings, a perspective as well as two exonometrics by hybriding rendered raster graphics and hidden line vector drawings. Okay. So we'll be doing some rendering, we'll be doing some make 2D, we can do some overlay uh, mapping in um, Photoshop. Um, we'll do some other things in Photoshop, okay? But at the end, you're gonna get three drawings out of this, two axons and one perspective. The required tools include Rhino and Grasshopper, the Rabbit plugin developed by MorphoCode, as we mentioned before, along with Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. I mean, those are, I mean, you're gonna need these things forever. The final deliverables, as I just mentioned, three drawings, okay? Um, each dem demonstrating a unique urban cellular aggregation prototype. It'll be submitted digitally in PDFs. The goal as always is to create the best, richest, most detailed drawings you've ever created ever. <laughs> I mean, every time you, you do something, you always try to make it the best thing you've ever done ever, right? All right. Let's talk about a few key terms and definitions. What do I mean by aggregate or aggregate? So aggregate in the noun or adjective means a whole formed by combining several typically disparate elements. The adjective meaning a formed or calculated by the combination of many separate units or items, right? So something large made from lots of little items. Verb means to form or group into a class or cluster, right? So you can begin to see, you're gonna take your little building block. You'll each have your own little individual building block. And then we'll begin to create a sort of much larger aggregate of these 
of hundreds, if not thousands of these little building blocks into something much larger. Aggregation is a noun of the formation of a number of things into a cluster. Cellular automata, right? Um, which is again, the sort of plural of a cellular automaton, right? A collection of colored cells on a grid of spe specified shape that evolves through a number of discrete steps according to a set of rules based on the states of the neighbors. So each cell responds to its neighbors, right? They can be on or off, alive or dead, right? The rules are then applied iteratively for as many generations or steps or ticks as desired. If you're interested in those, you can always look these links up in um, uh, Stephen Wolfram's uh, Math World um, site's a pretty good one. Um, Conway's Game of Life, of course, is uh, the example of uh, a cellular automaton that we'll be looking at. Um, again, here are the rules that we talked about before, right? You want to remind yourself. So here are some examples from 2019. Okay, you'll produce three urban aggregation drawings, two axons and one perspective. Here's a sort of quick matrix of some of the better axons that were developed for students. Again, a lot of them actually simulated, let's say a typical sort of building stock in a sort of typical urban environment and then actually made these things grow onto those almost as if they were sort of parasites. They have an interesting way to sort of think about how to um, further embellish and maybe densify existing downtown cores, urban cores. A Couple more close up. Each one of these has a different building block. Some are quite square and just have different uh, surfaces subtracted or, or openings in them. Um, others are much more expressive. This is almost looks like an, an a three-dimensional asterisk or like a sort of jack from a you know, jack and ball, sort of jacks, um, et cetera, right? Or L-shaped or T-shaped components. I'll give you an example. You know, I did this project ahead of time in order to make sure everything worked. So here are my examples, right? Let's say these are the example of what you're gonna produce, right? Axon number one. I went full crazy here. Axon number two, it looks like this, the cellular automaton actually ate the city. And then why not? Let's just, let's just add some tubes for transportation or something vertically throughout, who knows. And then a quick overall immersive perspective where we begin to understand or think of ourselves within the city, um, looking at things and uh, adding maybe a little bit of tone, lighting, color, et cetera. I actually want to do more with the perspectives than just this, <laughs> okay? We'll talk more about Photoshop and how you can begin to, um, honestly, when it comes to creating perspectives and adding materials and things like that, you have two options, right? One is to try to create shaders and maps that you can actually render with. Sometimes those look okay and sometimes those don't. Sometimes they just adds the amount of the time that it takes to render like substantially, like by magnitude of four or five. Um, other times you can basically start to collage things together in Photoshop and that's the approach I like to take. And that's the approach I've done in 267, which I don't think I've taught in a long time, but um, except for this past summer. Um, but then um, when I teach the grad students, the bridge students in the grad program, all this stuff, you know, I, I uh, we, we talk a lot about sort of adding um, textures and overlay layers in Photoshop. And so maybe that's what we can do here, okay? In order to give this a little bit of materiality, um, but in a nice way. And not in a sort of in your face um, uh, rendered, um, uh, rendered map way. All right, so that PDF example is here for you to look at if you ever want to refer to it. Um, here's some close-ups of the axons. Here's some example of some of those perspectives. I think we can do better than this this time around. We'll try our best, right? Kevin decided to add the moon. I think he actually had the Millennium Falcon in here at some point, I don't know why. Um, Phoebe had something nice here. Kay had something going on here with good color scheme. Okay, let's talk about calendar before we go into talking about what's what you need to do between now and Wednesday. The calendar is such, we don't have that many days left. 
that's the part where you clap and cheer and then you start to run and scream in horror at the idea of how much you have to do in such a short amount of time. But again, the thing here is to work smarter, not just harder. Today is Monday, the 16th of November. We have Wednesday this week, then we have Monday and Wednesday of next week. After that, we'll have Thanksgiving. I want to make all of those days at attendance mandatory and we will basically produce um, these models, these city models in person in during class together and then begin to format the drawings together as well next week in class. If you just show up in class, you don't have to work outside of class. If you come to class, you won't even have to like look at the recording of the class and refer back to the recording to try to do things over again outside of class. Okay? So again, the next two weeks, bear with me. Tenants mandatory, if you just show up ready to get some work done over the next hour, hour plus a few minutes here and there, like 15 minutes, you'll get a lot accomplished, we'll get a lot accomplished together um, in a short amount of time and you don't have a lot of outside work to do in this class, okay? After Thanksgiving, we have what's called study week, which is really the sort of hell week for School of Architecture, as you know. Um, I think the second years will be giving their presentations on Monday. You guys are third years, most of you. We'll probably be doing it on Wednesday, December 2nd. Those days I will be here on Zoom. And those, those are attendance optional, okay? Those are just there for any troubleshooting if you need it. If you have any questions, you're not required to come, okay? And then to give you a little more time, again, you could always turn things in and complete things by November 25th. But if you still need some time, I'd give you plenty of time. Wednesday of finals week is when these things are finally due. So if you need some time to, you're, you're like 90% by this date, and then you're like, I don't have any time for a million. I'm not even gonna be here. Um, you know, I gotta work on, on my studio project up until 1 p.m. on Wednesday, December 2nd. After that, I'm gonna crash, then I have to start studying for my history exam or my C-Tech exam, right? And then, you know, by finals week is when you have a chance to sort of get, put the finishing touches on, on your PDFs, that's fine. These won't be due until the 9th. December. Okay, so we've built in the time in class for these next two weeks to do this, to do this work and get it done. Okay, as much as possible. Um, when you guys are fully have your, your feet planted on the gas pedal, um, the following week after we get back from Thanksgiving, when you guys have more presentations, I'm here to help, but class time is optional. And, uh, and then finally, I've given you plenty of time afterwards to complete all of your studio work, um, make up any lost time you need, um, even get sleep and, and start eating correctly again uh, before I actually require the, the final version from you guys to grade, okay? So I'm trying to be as accommodating as I can. Um, Wednesday the 9th, I mean, I don't wanna go any further than that. I really like to try to get, thing, get all the grading done by Friday of finals week. So for studio, for this stuff, I just don't like leaving. I, I just, I don't, I like to procrastinate, but not with grading, not with final grades, especially. Um, I would like to get those things entered in and um, get them done, get it, get it taken care of. Okay. All right. So that's it. So this week, today we have launched Project three, we talked a little bit about complex and generative systems. Um, your only assignment between now and Wednesday is to go to this link and you'll get the install file and documentation. Let's see, I'm just trying to log in, see what happens when I do that. I don't remember, maybe I'll use my regular Gmail account here and see what's going on. See if I can remember my password. Yes. Well, it's been a while. Ah. <laughs> Maybe I'll try this one. Uh, uh. Oh. Sign up. Hmm. 
No, don't use that. All right, sorry. Registration complete. Stop doing this, Chrome. Leave me alone. All right. You can download things, I believe. You have a problem downloading, you know, do download a zip file. Let's see. I'll pull up what that folder looks like when you unzip it. Right, so there's a, a website, a .url. There's also this GHA thing. If I click on the URL, it'll open up my browser. In my case, Safari, in your case, could be Chrome or Firefox or um, whatever the Microsoft browser is anymore. It's not Internet Explorer anymore, is it? I think they rebranded it. Get started. There's some um, things to do here, but basically, there should be instructions on how to install it. What in the world? Install. Oh, yeah, here we go. Download the latest version of Grab It here. Okay, here we go. Open Grasshopper, go to File, Special Folders, Components folder. Then you can place this in. You can see it. Um, then start using, then you can, uh, you'll see the, the you have to restart Rhino, start Grasshopper, you'll see the Rabbit toolbar. Be one of the, one of the tabs in your Grasshopper um, interface now. Um, Antonor asked me, does this work with Mac? You'll have to see, double check and see if it does, Antonor. If it doesn't, we'll just have to figure out a way to work around this, okay? Um, already downloaded and works on the Mac just fine. Oh, sweet, okay, it works on the Mac. Okay, so it's cross-platform, that's great to know. So it works on the Mac or PC uh, version of Rhino, so good. Um, but what you'll see is that this will be a tab that shows up on, on Grasshopper. Um, again, I'm going to give you a file to use, right, um, that you can begin to use with Grasshopper and Rabbit. You have to have the plugin installed in order to, to, to use the, the file. I'll show you just what this kind of looks like here. It looks like we'll actually be getting out of here early today. That's always a nice thing. Go ahead and move this out of the way. Anybody has a hard time um, downloading or something? Just just uh, show me, tell me, and I'll let's see. Not sure why Windows requires me to type in my name and not password, but whatever. Stop caring. What's interesting about Rabbit is that it it has a cellular automata engine. It also has a, um, a Lindemeyer and L system engine. So it's kind of an interesting, fun little tool when it comes to deploying these generative systems in, in interesting ways. If you want to experiment with that with architecture. I'll just go ahead and pop this up. Give you just a second for Rhino to start, I guess. Sometime today. Open this one up. Okay. Yeah, I don't care. Close. Yeah, my fan's working extra overtime here on my MacBook Pro. Not responding. Hmm. It's weird. Must be a big file. Eh, sounds about right. In the login, do we need... Uh username um there is like register and do login yeah you just register and uh you know to create your own login and uh, then it'll take you to where you can download and then also see the instructions for how to install i didn't see the register link um login to download so when you go to morphocode.com slash rabbit Found it, never mind, sorry. That's all right. 
That's okay. Hopefully that's the only problem we have this whole time. It'll be really great. Um, so anyway, I think what you'll see here, maybe, I'm just going to quickly, select a portion of this and hide it. What you'll see is that I had a set of blocks that I turned on or off in a grid, and that became the initial seed. Then in each generation, it built up another floor in my urban uh, landscape here, my urban scape here. And so the, the way this gets higher is the more um, iterations or the more generations you go, right? And so uh, let me just turn this back on. And so the actual result, let's see. It's just a function of how, where you start. Um, let me just, uh, sorry, I just got, uh, let's see, visibility show again. There we go. Right. And so this is a number of generations, right? Because it's, it's quite tall um, as this thing sort of moves up, right? Um, and you can see that my building block was like the sort of three-dimensional sort of block that's, you know, had some, um, you know, I did a Boolean subtract, right? So it's basically one, two, three, it's sort of three-faced uh, cube, essentially. Let me just create a new file. Sure, no, let them change, don't save anything. Large objects and just, sure, why not? And I'll open up the grasshopper file for you really quickly so you can see maybe a little more about how this works. Again, we'll go through this step by step together on Wednesday. So you'll be able to follow along pretty nice. Just want to show this. Let's see. Recent files. There we go. And so what you'll start with is a grid, right? And over here, we'll actually make a set of points, populating certain cells in the grid. The, the cells with points are live cells. The ones without points are dead cells. And then what we'll do is, let's see here. Manual time control. We'll build up vertically tick by tick or generation by generation. So if I change this to one, so the next generation, right, we'll get another layer. So each generation in this sort of cellular automaton is stacked on the preceding one. And so three dimensionally, we actually build up. We actually grow a city, right? Now these points then are locations in space that we can begin to make copies of our initial building, our building block, right? Our sort of, um, you know, our, our spatial component. And so you can begin to make a sort of little unit, right? And you would reference it in from Rhino somewhere over here. Here it is, right? You'd right click, set one B rep, select it over here. And then suddenly you would make lots and lots of copies at each of these points, right? And so you start to stack the, the building blocks up based off of this point pattern, right? Cool, huh? What? W-U-T. All right, so I can't wait to see you guys on Wednesday. I mean that this time. Um, because uh, we're, again, I'll, I'll give you this file. Um, you'll, you'll create your own building block. Um, you'll start to create your own seed pattern and then you'll, you'll grow stuff. And then once you grow stuff, you'll save it and you'll start a new file and you'll do it again and you'll save that one, right? And uh, after you make a couple of these, you'll, you'll need two to, to sort of use as drawing to make you know, um, an axe on a beach, right? That we'll do next week. Um, you'll also select the, your favorite one to do the perspective of. And then next week, we'll, we'll do the fine tuning with uh, making the drawings, right? 
which will be make 2D and rendering, um, and then some Photoshop and Illustrator afterwards. Okay. Cool stuff. All right, that's it for the day. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. All right, Morpho Code Rabbit. Who knew architecture would be so fun? It's like Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs>